Life is all about decision making, your selections, your decisions along with your responses to other people's decisions are really the only thing in life you can control, which means your decisions is the way in which you and I control our lives. You see, whether you like it or not, you are where you are today because of your decisions. Yeah, it's your fault. You have to take responsibility for that. And yet if you're like most people, your greatest regrets are connected to the decisions that you've made. And what happens is this, we don't learn from our decisions, do we? Because we typically blame them on other people. We point our fingers. And our decisions, though, are heavily influenced by our emotions and by our appetites. Did you get that? You see, research tells us that we make decisions because of our emotions, that really we can't make decisions apart from our emotions. And our experiences confirm that our appetites are often in charge of us, and they overrule our intelligence. You see, here's what we have to come to, and that is this. Our decisions have been shaped and directed the qualities of our life. Our decisions have been shaped, and they also determine the qualities of our life. You see, you and I never fully know what hangs in the balance of a decision. We just don't. We never fully know. Now, what we do know is the private decisions that you and I make have public implications. Your private decisions and my private decisions, guess what? They're not going to stay private. No way. Your personal decisions will no doubt impact and influence a large group of people, more than what you ever think. And now the biggest challenge is when you're making those decisions and you don't know the outcome. You're not for sure about how it's going to affect you and those around you. You see, no one plans on complicating their life with wrong decisions or poor decisions or bad decisions. None of us do. And so your decisions are huge. They're huge. Now what I wanna do is I wanna share with you some questions that I've learned from Andy Stanley. He just wrote a book and it's called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And it's an important book for every person to read. So I wanna encourage you to buy that book because it's just one of the best books I've read. And what it does is it gives us a grid to make decisions in all areas of life. And there's nothing more important than learning how to make good decisions. And so I want to give you those five questions. The first question is the question of integrity. The question of integrity. This is so important and you might say, why? Because you and I can convince ourselves of anything. Isn't that right? Absolutely. You've talked yourself in many decisions because of the emotions and because of the appetites. It's called confirmation bias. And that's where the tendency happens in your life and in my life to look for evidence and confirmations of the existing beliefs and theories that we possess. We look for information or arguments to support what we've already decided and what we've already believed and planned to do. And we see what we want to see, right? We hear what we want to hear. We believe what we want to believe. And anything contrary to that, you know what we do? We just tune it out. We just push it aside. Don't believe me? Remember the last time you were looking to buy a car? You saw that same model everywhere. And you're thinking in your mind, you know what? Must be God. Must be God. He wants me to get this car. I'm seeing it everywhere. And your brain was tuned in to identify it. And it happens almost with everything in life. You find what you're looking for and then you believe that that's what you need. And you need to be aware of that. I need to be aware of that. You see, when we talk to ourselves, we talk ourselves into doing things and buying things and making decisions out of our emotions and out of our appetites. And we pay. And sometimes we pay dearly because they affect our future. And some of us are still reaping from some of those decisions. And maybe you'll just pay for that the rest of your life. 
And don't you know they come up at the most opt-in times where you don't want them to come up, I don't want them to come up, things that you wish you could go back and change, things that you wish you could go back and talk yourself out of, maybe that bad purchase, maybe that car, or maybe that boat, or the time you got a DUI, okay, or maybe that bad relationship, that marriage, or that business partner that you chose, or those bad habits that you're fighting right now, or that addiction, they all came through making choices. And so the question that we have to ask in this is this, am I being honest with myself in making this decision? Really being honest. Am I really being honest about this decision? Do I have integrity? Proverbs says it like this, the one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. Wow, you want that? But the one who is deceivious will eventually be exposed. You see, there's a difference between being dishonest and deceitful. You see, dishonest is much more easier to detect because when we're deceived, it's a mixture of what? Half-truths. And so we must ask ourselves this question. Am I being honest with myself? Really being honest. And so we need to make a decision. And here's the decision we need to make. I will not lie to myself even though the truth makes me feel bad about myself. It's the integrity question. Here's the second question, and it is this. It's the legacy question. The legacy question. Every decision that you make becomes a permanent part of your story, the story of your life. Every decision that you make has an outcome. Every decision that you make and I make has a consequence. And the outcome and the consequences are the things that you and I don't predict. We didn't think it was going to happen that way. Yet they become a part of our permanent story. And so when you and I are making a decision, we need to press pause. And we need to ask this question. What story do I want to be able to tell? To tell my spouse, to tell my kids, to tell my friends. You see, it's easy for you and I to lose sight of the bigger picture. Would you agree with me? We can give in and I can give in to the pressure of the moment or the temptation of the moment. And when you and I are forced to make a decision under pressure, it's hard to think about the future. When you and I are tempted to do something, it's hard to think about the future, isn't it? And this complicates the decision-making process because we have a tendency to focus on the immediate, the now rather than the future. And usually this because it is of a strong emotion and an appetite appeal that dwells in you and dwells in me. It plays to our emotions. And our experiences confirm this over and over again, that we are people who make decisions out of our emotions and out of our appetites, even over our intelligence. And so we think of the now and we don't think about the future. And when I look back on this decision, I have to ask, which of the options do I really want to choose? Because it's going to be a part of my life story. And so what story do I want to write and tell? Paul says it like this. He says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And so I have to say, would I want somebody to follow this example? Would I want to really tell this story if I'm going to make this decision? And so what we have to think about is this. I'm writing a story. You're writing a story. Picture yourself 10 years from now. Is that the story that you want to be able to tell? Are you headed in the right direction? And so we have to make a decision again. And here's the decision that we need to make. I will write a story I'm proud to tell one decision at a time. Here's the third question that we need to, to process, and that is conscious, okay? Usually, when we're in the process of making a decision, I know I am, okay, there is tension that rises up inside of me, and we feel it, right? There's something about it that maybe doesn't seem completely right. It's not that it's wrong. There's just a level of where maybe you're not completely comfortable. There's something about it that bothers you, and it causes you to what? Hesitate. It's not a no, and yet there may be some uneasiness there. 
and you have to pay attention to it. You can't blow it off. If you do, you probably won't make the best decision. And so here's the question that I have to ask. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? And so what happens is I come back to my conscience. What does my conscience say? Luke writes this, and he records it from Paul. So I strive always, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Wow. You see, that's, that's how we make decisions. We, we want to keep a clear conscience before man and before God. And so here's the decision that we need to make. We need to make it prior to any decisions that we make. I will explore rather than ignore my conscience. When I feel that twitch inside, I'm not going to just discard it. I'm going to ask deeper questions. Now, these three questions, okay, are a little bit uncomfortable. Would you agree with me? But you know what? They are worth asking. And I truly believe that they will help you. They will help me to live a life with fewer and fewer regrets. Let me give you the fourth one. The fourth one is maturity. The question of maturity. One of the problems we face often, often in making decisions is based on the question that only focuses on the broadest or the most widely applicable requirement. That being, okay, we ask questions like this. Is it morally wrong? Is it morally wrong? And we continue to ask questions like this, okay? Is there anything wrong with it? Could I get away with this? Is it legal? And we assume that if there's nothing morally or legally wrong with it, it's a decision that I can say yes to. I can say it's okay and I can move in that direction. And yet if you're a follower of Christ today, we want our lives to be defined by wisdom. We want to be able to make wise choices. And so here's the question. What is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? Not is it right or is it wrong. What is the wise thing to do? You see, asking what is the wise thing to do is a natural outpouring of something I'm already trying to accomplish. But whether you are religious or not, the question is still very, very valid. You see, you respond to life's decisions based on whatever your worldview is. And no matter what your worldview is, all of us want to make good decisions. And so it can and should be asked, okay? And it's not exclusively a spiritual concept. What makes this so wise? What makes this question so powerful is what it does for you and what it does for me. And we end up being less emotional, about the decision. We end up being less focused on relationship issues. We end up being less controlled by our own selfishness and greed, less controlled by those things around us. We're, we're less able to rationalize our decisions. And you see, all of these issues you and I face in the process of making decisions. And so the question is very much worthwhile to ask because it diminishes all of those issues. You see, to really gain clarity on making good decisions, we have to dig deeper with the question. And we have to look at it from three different angles. And Andy talks about this in his book, and here's what he says. Ask yourself this. In light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wisest thing for me to do? Now, Paul writes to a group of people in Ephesus, and here's what he would say. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as what? Wise. Asking that question, what is the wise thing to do? Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, he says, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And so we have to ask the question, what is the wise thing to do? And we have to make this decision in our heart. I will take the past, the present, and the future into consideration when I make this decision. It's not just going to be a now. Let me give you the fifth and final one, and that is the relationship. 
the relationship. Now, this is a very dangerous question, okay, because this will lead you beyond right and wrong. This question will lead you to consider things that most people would never, ever, ever entertain. This question might cost you some money, some time. It might even cost you a relationship. This could cost you your job. I know people who started spending less time at work and more time with their family when they asked this question. I know people who started spending less money and started giving more money away when they ask this question. I know people who have been hurt and betrayed and who have forgiven those people. Why? Because they know that God has forgiven them. And it's this, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? See, if you would talk to any of those people, they, they would tell you that it saved them from a life of bitterness and regret and resentment over something that they couldn't have changed anyways. And common sense would say, hang on to your hurt. Common sense would say, continue to tell your sad, 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 sad story. Use it to get back at them. Use it to, to hurt the people who hurt you. And yet there is power in this question. And it will provide uncomfortable clarity. And it's this, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? If you ask this question, what does love require of me, you will know the answer clearly, I promise you. Though it might be uncomfortable, it's an invitation for you and me to live a larger life than just ourselves. And if you're not intentional with your life, you'll never live the bigger life. You'll always live a small life. And so we have to come back and we have to ask, what does love require of me? You see, this is the question that Jesus asked. And Paul says this about Jesus. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What was his mindset? What does love require of me? And it ensures you and I that we will not live a small life. You see, the way in which God loves you and me, we're called to love other people. We love God by loving other people. So what would be the most loving thing to do with the people around me? What would be the most loving thing for me to do in making this decision? Paul describes the mindset of, of Jesus with this. He says, be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will harm your cherished unity. Don't allow your self-promotion to hide in your hearts. But in authentic humility, put others first and view others more important than yourselves. Abandon, listen to this, abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interest. Wow. If we would ask that question, you know what? We would live with fewer regrets. And so we have to make this decision in our hearts. I will decide with the interests of others in mind. I will decide with the interests of others in mind. You see, I want you to begin to ask these five questions, especially between now and the end of the year. If you will, I promise you, you'll have less regrets. Imagine what could happen in your personal life, in your professional life. Imagine what could happen in your marriage. Imagine what could happen in your family. Imagine what could happen at work. Imagine what could happen in your relationship with God. Imagine how strong, how strong you could finish life with if we would just begin to ask these questions. Be unbelievable, wouldn't it? And so I encourage you to go back and begin to ask these questions. Because you're making decisions. They're leading you somewhere. You see, life is all about making decisions. And the better decisions that you make, the less regrets you'll have in your life. And Jesus wants to help you with that. You see, Jesus makes life better, and he makes you and I better at life because he's willing to lead us and guide us. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you today for who you are. We love you. And we thank you that you've created us as free will people, that you give us choices. You allow us to make choices. 
but you also have said that you'll give us your wisdom. You'll, you'll lead us and you'll guide us and you'll direct us. And God, I believe for myself as well as all of us here today, if we would begin to use these five questions as a grid, we'd have fewer regrets in our life. We'd finish life stronger and more confident than ever before. And so, Jesus, we just want to invite you into the decision-making process because we know that you only desire that which is good and that which is best for us. And you want us to live life and live life to the fullest. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.